Okay, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Yat-eh, Delphina Thomas, Yunishia, Kotsani, Bashishin, Hanarapi, Deshche, Doki, Ani, Deshinale. I'm here as the acronym on this is supposed to be F A F S A, but they switched the S and the F. So, uh, FAFSA Anti. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about FAFSA today. And if you have any questions, please put them in the chat and we'll address them at the end. I'm just going to go through my presentation. And um, again, if you have questions, throw them in the chat because I'm sure a lot of people probably have the same questions as well um, or similar questions. So um, what we're going to talk about is just a little bit um, about planning for college, right? So what does that look like? Um, so what does your path look like when you're planning for college? Is it a community college, a university, trade school, maybe military? But let's talk about getting to that path and what we can do. Um, so what are the requirements? What could you be doing right now to get there? Um, and one of the things that I always recommend is going to collegescorecard.ed.gov. So with College Scorecard, you can actually uh, look at different options for colleges, trade schools, uh, maybe tribal colleges, community colleges. So for instance, um, you know, with uh, tribal colleges, uh, there are a few um, here in Arizona, or there's a couple. So there's Tahona Atham Community College. Um, down in Sells, Arizona, right around Tucson area. Um, there is a couple in Minnesota as well. So we're talking about tribal colleges and a lot of them also offer uh, online programs, uh, or I'm sorry, online classes. Um, but the most important thing is how do you pay for college? So that's what we're going to talk about today is paying for college. Um, so they call me FAFSA auntie because in 2021, I actually went viral for um, yelling positive affirmations to a bunch of high school graduates and um, students reached out to me from everywhere asking for help with their FAFSA. Um, and so I went viral. I, I didn't mean to, I was just, you know, being myself, being an auntie and yeah, that, that happened. Um, but with my FAFSA experience, I've not always been a, um, you know, I, I haven't always known a lot about FAFSA. I haven't known, I didn't even know what FAFSA was until I had to fill out the form. Um, my mom and dad did not have any experience with FAFSA because uh, my mom actually was taken out of school when she was in third grade uh, by my great grandmother. And so my great grandmother taught her um, that weaving and jewelry making and um, taking care of sheep were important to becoming, um, you know, to being a Diné woman. And so, um, yeah, that's what she did. And uh, so she didn't graduate from high school um, or go to college. And so my dad, he went to a boarding school uh, in Palaka, Oklahoma. Um, it was Chilaco. Indian Agricultural School is where he went. And so he didn't go to college either. Um, so I'm a first generation college student. I have three older siblings who did not get their bachelor's degree. Um, I also come from a low income um, home with, you know, with my mom and my dad. My mom was on welfare. Um, she was on food stamps, all of these things. Uh, but with my education, I actually received my bachelor's from Brown University, um, my master's from ASU in Indigenous Rights and Social Justice. And then also um, I'm working on my PhD right now at ASU in Justice Studies, focusing on Indigenous feminisms, activism, and story work. Um, with my financial aid career, I actually worked at the Maricopa Community College Call Center. I had no idea 
<laughs> what I was talking about most times with financial aid. I didn't know what a lot of the forms were, but I learned. Um, and then I worked at Wells Fargo Student Loan Department, which was really, you know, eye opening in that a lot of students took out a lot of money for their college education, which was unfortunate, but you know, it does have to be done sometimes. And then eventually I went to ASU um, as a financial aid counselor. And that's where I learned a lot about financial aid um, and the process itself. So FAFSA, what is the FAFSA? Um, so FAFSA is a free application for federal student aid, which means you should never pay to complete your FAFSA. Um, everyone should be filling out FAFSA, and in order to receive any federal aid you're eligible for from the federal government and access additional funding from your school, um, like scholarships, you'll have to fill out the FAFSA. Uh, the FAFSA opens October 1st of every single year, and so when you go to fill out the FAFSA, you're going to go to fafsa.gov. It's always a government website, so you should never go to .com, .org, um, or uh, like .net. Um, oftentimes, those are scam websites, and they're going to try to charge you to pay for your FAFSA, but don't do it. Don't pay ever. Uh, as far as filling out your FAFSA, you'll need your parents' email address, uh, an FSA ID to sign electronically, you and your parents' social security numbers. If you are not a U.S. citizen, then you'll need your um, ARN or your alien registration number on your green card. Um, you and your parents need uh, federal tax returns. So if you file taxes and your parents file taxes for the year it's requesting, you'll need that. Um, W-2s as well. You could also use something called the data retrieval tool. Um, your parents' date of birth. I know some of you are like, why? Like, I, I know my parents' date of birth, but sometimes students forget. So make sure that you get that. Um, the date that your parents uh, or parent um, got married, divorced, separated, etc. cetera. Um, and then bank statements and records of investment, if applicable. A lot of people don't have that, and it's totally fine. Uh, records of untaxed income, if applicable. Again, if your parents or you are like, I don't know what this is, I don't have it, totally fine. So with the FSA ID, it actually allows parents and students to identify themselves electronically to sign off on the FAFSA. Um, so you and your parent would need one, and you can actually create an FSA ID online. If you and your parents both have social security numbers, um, you know, if your parent doesn't have a social security number, they won't be able to create an FSA ID. They'll just have to man like use a actually sign a signature page when you fill out your FAFSA. Um, as far as if you have a green card, um, you wouldn't be able to create one, um, and you'll have to sign as well. Just totally fine, and. With the FSA ID, you're actually not considered an independent. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. No, you can sign off if you have an ARN. Um, yeah, sorry. Uh, but anyway, students who aren't considered um, independent or dependent will need this. So if you're under 24 years old, you're still considered dependent on your parents and you're going to need this. Um, if you and your parents, um, you and your parents' FSA ID is connected to your uh, personal information, like your social security number, date of birth, all of that. So if you lose it or if you forget the login, you can't just create another one. You just have to um, reset your password. And then also it helps you submit your FAFSA quickly. So again, for the FSA ID, this is the first step in completing your FAFSA. Um, or starting your FAFSA, actually. So you, similar to what you need to complete your FAFSA, Social Security, all of this stuff. And then um, when you have your FSA ID, it is important that if you move or you get a new phone number or a new email address that you update your FSA ID with that information. Um, because if you if you if your phone number or your email address is tied to it, and then you get a new one, 
and you can't log in, you can't, um, you know, you forget your email or something, or you forget your password, um, then you're going to have to use the phone number or email address to reset your password. Uh, so it's really dependent on those two things. So I would definitely suggest um, updating as that information changes. Also, keep the information in a safe place because it is really sensitive information. Okay, and then uh, FAFSA myths. So with FAFSA, um, with FAFSA itself, there are a lot of myths that come with, um, you know, like questions that students have that I've heard many times where they're like, well, I've heard this or I've heard that. Um, but oftentimes it's not the case. So for instance, myth number one, my parents make too much. Regardless of how much your parents make, you should fill out the FAFSA. So even if you don't qualify for the federal Pale Grant, which is free money, you still may receive money from your college. Um, and then FAFSA also may be required to fill, uh, you may be required to fill out FAFSA as criteria for scholarship applications. Uh, my parents don't support me. So a lot of students have become pretty independent uh, in that they have their own houses or like their own apartments. Um, they pay for their own cars, their own bills, whatever it might be. Um, unfortunately, if you're 20, under 24 years old and you still have contact or relationship with your parents, you still need to fill out the FAFSA. It's only until you turn 24 years old that the government says that you're an independent student or you're an independent person, which means that you don't need parent information. Um, so keep that in mind when you're filling out FAFSA. I only need to submit my FAFSA once. Um, yes and no. Uh, so some this is for students who say, like, I have submitted my FAFSA last year. Why do I need to do it again? Um, I already submitted my FAFSA. So you do have to submit a FAFSA every single year because you and your parents' income and circumstances change every year. And your FAFSA should reflect that. Uh, so one important reason to fill out your FAFSA is that your financial aid can differ from year to year, which means that your financial aid eligibility can change based off of your parents' economic status or the number of students enrolled in college at the same time as you. Um, so it sounds kind of like trivial um, that maybe your parents uh, have like three children you have maybe two younger siblings. Um, if your parents income stays the same every single year, but then the number of college student increases. So maybe you're the first one to go to college and then your sibling goes to college and then the other sibling goes to college. FAFSA is going to say like, oh, wow, this parent's income is this amount. Um, so like now they have one student in college. Oh, next year, they're going to have two students in college, you know, and so on and so forth. But the income changes. So FAFSA is looking at it like, oh, wow, now they have three college students. That's, you know, that's a lot of college students. So let's go ahead and increase their Pell Grant based off of how many, you know, students are enrolled in college, that sort of thing. So it might change every single year. Um, and then as far as FAFSA goes, they... <laughs> I've had students say like, well, I didn't do great in high school, um, so I won't qualify for FAFSA. So FAFSA actually doesn't look at um, GPA when considering you as like a first time freshman. So GPA is important and it will help you get into a good school and help with academic scholarships. But most federal student aid programs actually don't take grades into consideration the first time you apply. So if you're a senior in high school and you apply for federal financial aid through FAFSA, uh, it's not going to take grades into consideration. But if you want to continue receiving federal aid throughout your college career, you do have to maintain satisfactory academic progress. Um, satisfactory academic progress varies by school, but generally, uh, your school will want you to keep a 2.0 GPA 
pass at least two thirds of your classes and then be on track toward your degree. So if you have a B average throughout or even a C average throughout uh, college, you're still passing your courses. Um, you're on track toward your degree. So you're not taking courses that don't apply to your degree. Um, and you're on track, you have your 2.0 and you're passing your courses, you're good. You're totally fine. Even better if you're getting A's and just flying through your courses, like no problem, right? Uh, number five, my parents can't pay the EFC. So when you submit your FAFSA, um, you'll see a confirmation page. And on that confirmation page, there's something called the estimated family contribution. So coming up in, I believe, um, not this FAFSA in October, but next FAFSA, you're going to see something called the student aid index. Pretty much the same thing, just a different, different word because EFC sounds kind of scary. Like, oh, you want my family to contribute this number? No, it's just there to tell us in the financial aid office, or I'm, I'm not in financial aid anymore, but to tell financial aid officers how much you need in federal financial aid or how much money you're eligible for. So for instance, uh, if you fill out FAFSA and there's a bunch of zeros there, that means that you're eligible for the full amount of the federal Pell grant and you have a high financial need. If there are numbers there, totally fine. It just means that you qualify for less of the federal Pell Grant than, say, someone who has all zeros. As long as that number is under 5000 you still qualify for some amount of the federal Pell Grant, which is, again, free money. Uh, myth number six, FAFSA is the only form I need to fill out for financial aid. Oftentimes, students will say, hey, you know what? I, um, I filled out FAFSA. Where's my scholarship? Well, that's not always how it works. Uh, FAFSA determines what type of federal financial aid you're eligible for. So for instance, it tells you if you're eligible for the federal Pell Grant, um, FSEOG, which is also dependent on if you're eligible for Pell, uh, federal student loans, work study. You have to apply for individual scholarships like tribal scholarships, or scholarships offered by nonprofit organizations, like our scholarship, for instance, uh, the Full Circle Scholarship. So the application closed on May 31st, uh, but there's plenty of other scholarships available out there. I would suggest doing a Google search for some of those scholarships. I can fill out the FAFSA anytime. Yes and no, um, sort of. So FAFSA opens up October 1st of every single year. Uh, it closes June 30th of every year, but that's not for like the current year. It, it sounds it, it sounds really confusing. But um, so, for instance, the what year are we in? <laughs> OK, so the 22-23 FAFSA, uh, that's the current year we're in for FAFSA. That's the current application. That's well, that's one of the current applications that's open. Um, and so the 22-23 FAFSA, that's gonna close on June 30th of this year. So for you seniors who wanna take summer classes, I would suggest filling out the FAFSA. So if you graduated in May and you're like, hey, I wanna take some summer classes to get a jump start on the fall semester, fill out the FAFSA right now so that you can take summer classes. Um, that's if you're a senior and you've graduated from high school. Um, Similar to if you're graduating, you know, next year, you want to fill out the FAFSA for that current year because that application will close on June 30th. Um, otherwise, you won't be able to take summer classes that are paid for. You can take summer classes, but if you fill it out, if you fill out the FAFSA after June 30th, those classes will not be paid for for the summer. So make sure that if you are graduating, whatever year, doesn't matter and you want to take summer classes, fill out that current FAFSA year and the next year as well. So like the FAFSA that's open right now is 22-23 and then the 23-24. So the 23-24 FAFSA, that's going to cover you for fall of 23, spring of 24, and summer of 24. So keep that in mind. And if you get confused, 
you know, or you're just like, I don't know which FAFSA to fill out. It's okay to fill out both of them. Nothing's going to happen. You're not going to get like penalized or anything. It's just, you know, just um, if you are, you know, thinking about taking summer classes. Um, also for students who are going to be seniors coming up, um, October 1st, FAFSA opens up, fill out the FAFSA as soon as it opens, because there is some funding that's given on a first come first serve basis, like the FSEOG. Um, also some scholarships do require students to fill out FAFSA at their own deadlines. So for instance, the Obama scholarship at ASU, um, which is pretty much like a full ride scholarship, they request that students fill out their FAFSA before January of that year. So for instance, if you're a senior right now and you want to go to ASU and fill out um, and you want to be considered for the Obama scholarship, um, there's you just go to their website, tells you what the eligibility criteria is. But one of the things they want is students to fill out their FAFSA before January. So FAFSA opens October 1st, just fill it out so you have a better chance of getting some of those um, scholarships and grants. Uh, I can't fill out the FAFSA because my parents don't have an income. So income is not a requirement to fill out your FAFSA. If your parents don't have any income for the year that FAFSA is asking for, it's okay to put zeros in there in the income portion. Um, so for this FAFSA coming up, it's going to be the 23, well, I guess it would be the 24, 25 FAFSA. Um, and they're going to be requesting 2022 tax returns. So if 2022, your parents or parents did not work, they didn't earn any income at all. It's okay to say my parents didn't earn any income and put zeros. That's totally fine. Um, also, if your parents, you know, like mine, uh, receive social security or social security disability income, um, my mom had really bad arthritis. Um, so she would like weave rugs for the longest time. Um, and that's how she made money. She would weave rugs, but then up to a certain point, her arthritis didn't allow her to do that. So she uh, applied for a social security disability income. And um, I didn't have to put that income on my FAFSA uh, as, as income under the income portion, because it wasn't like income that she made. So she didn't like work a job and make that income she received it because it was um you know it was part of her the social security disability that she received so that stuff doesn't have to be reported um as income so fafsa is too complicated it's so much easier to fill out the fafsa on fafsa.gov because the online version skips questions that actually don't pertain to you and it makes it so much easier to complete. Um, also, if you have the list of things that FAFSA is requesting on hand, so for instance, you have your parents' login information for their FSA ID, you have your um, parents' um, tax returns, um, any other information you have, your tax returns, you have all of that ready, then you're good. It'll be so quick. It'll be like 20 minutes, if that. But once you complete the FAFSA, uh, the next year you can actually do something called the FAFSA renewal option, which just makes it easier to fill out the FAFSA. Um, number 10, I'm done with my FAFSA. That's it. All I need to do. Not necessarily. So, 30% of students who complete FAFSA are selected for verification by the Department of Education. Um, but the school that you're attending will request the document. So verification basically is providing additional documentation to the school um, to verify some of the information that's reported on FAFSA. So that might be tax returns, W-2s, household size forms, or other documents. Um, and then just a few terms to know. So EFC estimated family contribution, COA is cost of attendance, and need. You'll hear this like need. How much money do I need to cover my expenses? Um, EFC is, it sounds like your family has to pay this amount, but that's not the case. It just tells 
colleges and universities how much uh, aid you're eligible to receive. So the EFC can be found at the end of the FAFSA when you're done completing um, the FAFSA itself. And FAFSA calculates the EFC according to this formula that they use internally, which includes like your family's taxed and untaxed income, assets, benefits, family size, um, family numbers in college, all of this information in the FAFSA. Um, so why do you need to know this information. Well, financial aid determines how much aid you're eligible for. And then this number, along with your cost of attendance, determines your need. So with the EFC, or I'm sorry, COA, cost of attendance, um, it's cost of attendance is the amount it costs you to attend the school that you want to go to. Um, and it includes things like tuition, which is in state or out of state, if you live on or off campus, enrolling in a meal plan, all of this stuff um, that, you know, it costs to attend college, uh, essentially. But oftentimes, um, cost of attendance, there's an estimate on your school's website. And again, that's just an estimate. So keep that in mind. Oftentimes, if you're not living on campus, or if you're um, not enrolled in a meal plan, then obviously you won't have to pay for that. But a lot of colleges will include that on their cost of attendance. So for instance, um, you can enroll in a lower meal plan um, or in a different housing option. Um, usually like honors colleges will be a lot more than maybe living um, in a different dorm. Um, or you could live off campus or live with your parents if that's an option. And then for the cost of attendance, if you're looking at colleges and you say, well, I can't afford that. Remember again that it's an estimate and it, the amount varies depending on different factors. So they're not exact amounts. Um, tuition could vary depending on the program you're enrolled in. So sometimes they'll show you the higher amount of tuition based off of like, say, I don't know, like a specialized engineering program. Um, but generally you want to look at, you know, just what your program is. Uh, you can always change your meal plan to a lower cost and you actually might receive a proration for the unused meals for the semester if your meal plan was higher. So that basically means if you choose a higher meal plan than mid semester or maybe, you know, whatever, you decide, you know what, I'm not eating three meals a day. I'm eating two meals a day because I have a 9 a.m. class and then, you know, my days are full. And so I only have lunch and dinner. Um, or maybe you're having breakfast in your dorm before class and then lunch and dinner you're having at the um, at the dining hall. So you can always change your meal plan and go down to a lower meal plan if you'd like. Um, so if you go down to a lower meal plan, you can get the portion of, um, say it was 5,000, now it's 4,000. That means that the 1,000 you would just get back or that you wouldn't have to pay for if you owe a balance. Um, also on-campus housing is going to be more expensive than living off campus with roommates or your parents and always apply for scholarships because after your tuition um, fees and like immediate costs, so like money that's due to the college, after all that is paid for and the college gets whatever they need, then you get the remaining a portion of what's left over. So if your college is like, hey, we got our $10,000, um, but you have $15,000 in scholarships, uh, then, you know, you get the 5,000 that's left over, which is a pretty good deal. And you can use that money to, you know, pay for off-campus housing, pay for meals, pay for transportation, personal expenses. Like if you need to, you know, go to Target and get some hygiene products, or you need to, by laundry detergent, you can use that refund for those costs. Need. Um, what does need have to do with college? So once you submit your FAFSA, uh, you'll be awarded. And if you've, if you've been awarded the Pale Grant, um, 
and different types of loans you're eligible for, um, you can actually calculate how much remaining need you have. When you know this amount, you can always figure out how much need-based aid you can start applying for. So for instance, you take your cost of attendance minus your estimated family contribution. That shows you how much need, how much money do you need to attend college? Well, um, if you know how much money you need, then your say your cost of attendance is 16,000, your EFC is 1,000, you need 15,000. So um, you won't be eligible for more than 15,000 in need-based aid. So you would be eligible for the following programs too, like the Federal Pell Grant, um, FSEOG, Subsidized Loan, Perkins Loan, Federal Work Study, lots of need-based scholarships and grants as well, which can come directly from your college um, or scholarships that you can apply for. Uh, so who can help you figure out your need? You, me, uh, your counselors. Um, so there's non-need-based aid. So for instance, um, this is like aid that you can apply for that's not need-based, so it's not dependent on how much money you need. Um, things like the direct unsubsidized loan, the PLUS loan, and then the uh, Teacher Education Access for College Higher Education Grant. So those are non-need-based aid. Um, as far as scholarships and grants, everyone should be applying for scholarships. Regardless of your parents' financial situation, you should definitely be applying for scholarships. Um, there's need-based scholarships, which I've told you just a minute ago, depends on how much need you have. And then there's non-need-based scholarships, um, which could be like academic scholarships, but also not dependent on grades as well. So there's tons of scholarships for everyone. Um, as far as scholarships, oftentimes students will fill out the demographic portion of the application and that's it or they'll forget to submit all the documents for the scholarships. Um, and then organizations will create wait lists. So you could be next in line for a scholarship as well. As for scholarships, make sure that you research what you're eligible for, apply for those scholarships, and then also apply for local scholarships offered by private and nonprofit organizations, Check out your school scholarship portals and just apply for all the scholarships. So start looking now, regardless of what grade level you're in, start looking. I started applying for scholarships when I was like a freshman in high school. Um, I know it sounds like, oh, this is an overachiever, but um, I actually was able to apply for a lot of those scholarships and uh, took that money. So the organization saved it for when I decided where I wanted to go and then sent the check directly to the financial aid office to pay down, you know, any anything that I owed. Um, though most scholarship portals like um, scholarship organizations or even your school scholarship portals will open in the winter and then also in the spring semester. Um, always keep in mind that deadlines are fast approaching, even though it seems like a month away. Definitely start your application, have someone revise that application and just, you know, continue applying. Um, also, some scholarships have hard deadlines while others have rolling deadlines where you can apply year round. Um, FastWeb is a good place. Um, I only put the Phoenix Public Library uh, org website in here because College Depot um, is like an area for students to get help with FAFSA and, you know, all of these resources for attending college. Um, but College Depot, that's a really good scholarship website. I just absolutely love it. Uh, Career One Stop, so nonprofit organizations, sometimes your parents' employers will offer scholarships as well. And then again, your college or university scholarship. So why do you need scholarships? So when you're applying for them, graduate debt-free, 
no student loans, ensure that college education is paid for to focus on your studies, um, extra money to pay for educational related expenses, no stress about how you're paying for your education. I would recommend taking a picture of these because I've been on a ton of scholarship, um, a bunch of scholarship, you know, reading like uh, as a reviewer um, for different places for different organizations. Like I was one at ASU. I was one at a community college um, for private and public organizations. And so these are like the top five answers. So if you could just take a picture of this and then add this into your essay, not like in a bullet point format like this, but just to say, hey, I want to graduate debt free. Um, I hope not to take out any student loans because I want to ensure that my college education is paid for so I can focus on my studies. I'll also need extra money to pay for educational related expenses so that um, and then I don't want to stress about how I'm paying for my education. So, yeah, that's like, you know, added to that, but also add more stuff. Um, create a list of scholarships. Put those dates in your phone, planner, calendar, wherever you'll see it. Uh, create a list of what every scholarship's requesting. Make sure to submit everything. Have someone proofread your essay. Um, and then if you haven't heard anything from the scholarship organization, whatever, um, by the time they said, hey, we're going to notify you by this date, send them an email or give them a call and ask them about the status of your application. Um, so we talked about grants, but there's also federal work study, which is where you work on campus part time um, or you're enrolled at a college. Sometimes there's really, really cool uh, jobs out there, which one will heighten, you know, will make your resume look pretty awesome, but also you can get paid for it. Um, so if you're interested in federal work study, say yes on the FAFSA question. Um, if you're like, mm, maybe still say yes. If you're like, absolutely not. I do not want to work. You can't make up. You can't change my mind at all. Say no. But if you say no and you decide later in the semester, hey, I do want to work. You're going to have to go back into your FAFSA, change that one question, resubmit your FAFSA, wait for your school to get it. So if you're just slightly interested, just rec I just recommend saying yes. Student loans. Um, so there's three types. There's the subsidized, which um, with the subsidized, there's unsubsidized, and then the direct plus loan. So uh, subsidized loans, the federal government pays for the interest while you're in school. Unsubsidized loans, interest starts to accumulate once those funds are dispersed. Direct plus loans are for either graduate students or parents of dependent undergrad students, and they have to apply for those. So do you need to take out a student loan? Maybe, possibly, but you should actually think about it before you do it. If you don't need it, don't take it out. You don't also have to take out the full amount. If you only need to borrow $100, only borrow $100. Um, if you're attending a community college or a tribal college, most likely the Pale Grant or tribal college scholarships will pay for pretty much everything. So keep that in mind. Um, and I know we don't have a lot of time left. Uh, can you share your slides with us? Can you add... Okay. Yeah, a lot of scholarships are closed right now, um, but there are some scholarships out there that are that have a rolling deadline. Um, I would recommend just doing a Google search of scholarships that might be available right now um, just for that purpose. Um, yeah, I can't think of any off the top of my head, but I know that it, there's also a tribal scholarship. So if you are a member of a tribe and they have a scholarship office, I would definitely recommend reaching out to them. Um, yeah. And I'm just thinking. Also, contact your school if you're attending school, if you're enrolled in college. 
um, that maybe they might have some funding for you as well um, to attend their college, but submitting your FAFSA is really important for that as well. Okay. Thank you so much, everybody, for your attention, for your time. Really appreciate you all being here and go be awesome, be wonderful, do great things because I know you're all capable of it.